Take their seats. We'll get this program started for the... We want to welcome everybody to our spring Global Economic Prospects event. Uh, um, I've participated in nearly every one of these for the last five and a half years, but this is my first time as a moderator rather than a presenter. Um, and that's a good thing because we have three really excellent uh, and topical presentations this afternoon by Karen Dine and Jacob Kierkegaard and Mark Nolan. Uh, Karen is going to present first, and she's going to present uh, her outlook for the global economy with a focus and an emphasis on developments in the United States economy. Um, as always, our global economic out outlook uh, is really a product of the, the intellectual depth and breadth of the senior fellows here at the Institute, and that certainly makes the job easier, putting together the, to putting together the outlook, uh, at least up to a point. Uh, for those of you who have attended uh, events like this in the past, you know that uh, the senior fellows here at the Peterson Institute don't always hold completely harmonious uh, views with respect to one another, so uh, it's Karen's job to make the final call on, on that. Um, Karen, as you know, is a non-resident senior fellow here at the Peterson Institute. Uh, she's also a professor of practice in the economics department at Harvard University. And she's really had a, a long, there's a long list of preceding accomplishments as well. She was the assistant secretary of the treasury. Uh, she was co-director of economic studies at the Brookings Institute, a senior staffer at the Federal Reserve Board here in Washington, uh, just to cite a few of these. Our second presenter will be uh, Jacob Kierkegaard. Uh, he's going to be wearing the hat today of an international labor economist uh, discussing recent employment and wage developments in the major advanced economies. Um, as you know, in addition to writing extensively about uh, labor, labor economics uh, and um, issues related to immigration and demographics, Jacob is also one of the Institute's leading ec experts on um, the political economy of Europe. Uh, final presentation will be Mark Noland. Uh, Mark's the Institute's Executive Vice President and Director of Studies here. You know, Mark wears so many hats that he could probably run a haberdashery. Uh, there's the, you look at his uh, resume, he's written extensively uh, about economies around the world, uh, focusing mostly on Asia, Africa and the Middle East. Um, I didn't notice anything on Mark's CV about Paraguay, uh, so if you need uh, some expertise on that, you're gonna have to go elsewhere, but pretty much anywhere else, he's your guy, he's your go-to guy. Um, Karen, would you like to get us started? Sure, um, thanks for that um, introduction. Uh, Dave, um, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank Adam as well, even though he's not here today. And I was actually, um, I was in class yesterday at Harvard uh, teaching uh, my intermediate macro class. And um, I was teaching the ISLM model. And I know this is going to sound really geeky, but it occurred to me that I should also thank the ISLM model uh, for uh, because it is actually proving to be such a useful tool right now in thinking about what's going on with the economy. Um, anyway, um, last fall when Dave presented the forecast, his theme was sustaining momentum. And that was an upgrade from what he had done in the spring, which was gaining momentum. Um, I have upgraded the forecast uh, further to a cyclical boom. Um, I've chosen the word boom because we're seeing brisk growth in so much of the world. Um, but I also chose the word cyclical because the brisk growth that um, we're getting and I think we're going to continue to get is really not a product of structural reforms that is uh, raising potential output growth, but rather um, a demand-driven uh, uh, cyclical phenomenon uh, that we should not uh, expect to um, persist over the longer run. Um, okay, so um, you know why the brisk outlook? Um, I think there are several factors coming into play, and the story is not that different from uh, what it was last fall uh, in some respects. Um, so monetary policy is accommodated, financial conditions are supported. Um, albeit not quite as uh, supportive as they were uh, last fall. 
Um, fiscal policy is stimulated. This is an area where the forecast really has changed. Our story last fall was that we'd moved um, kind of around the globe from restrictive fiscal policies to policies that were either neutral or for the United States kind of better than neutral in terms of kind of expecting a moderate uh, stimulus from fiscal policy. Of course, it's turned out that the fiscal stimulus uh, that we're getting is, is larger than we expected. And I'm going to elaborate on that later in the talk. Um, the outlook is also um, strong because confidence is high. Business and consumers, not just in this country, but in many countries around the world, and that's playing a role. I should say that this kind of brisk outlook over the next couple of years, it's not without its risks, and I will come back at the end of the talk just to mention them. Uh, one risk, important risk, is the spread of protectionist policies, and of course Mark will be picking up on that theme. And I think the other um, risk, which it ties into kind of this, this being a cyclical boom, is that there is, um, there is scope for a more than modest overshooting of the economy in this country in a way that could prove difficult to, to correct. Okay, so um, this uh, shows my um, global outlook. Um, it's uh, all in terms of uh, annual average over annual average growth rates. Uh, but just to kind of give you a summary of where I am after talking to all of my wonderful Peterson colleagues on this topic, um, the U.S., of course, uh, we're going to see elevated growth over the next couple of years because of fiscal conditions. Um, the euro area, um, I'm looking for above trend gains, um, continued kind of broad-based growth as uh, the euro area economies go back to full employment. Um, Japan actually saw um, a good year by Japan standards uh, last year. Um, and I'm looking for growth to slow in 2018 and 2019, not as much as, uh, as, as some are forecasting. I mean, this 1.3 and 1.2, they're still very decent growth rates for Japan. Um, but this is after talking to my Peterson colleagues who expect that monetary policy is going to remain looser and that there'll be some fiscal support from the coming Olympics in Japan. Um, for the UK, uh, that's still an area uh, that's a bit of an exception. Um, we're looking for more modest growth there, still held back by uh, investment, uh, uh, investment still held back by Brexit concerns, and there's, con of course, uncertainty around that. Uh, for China, uh, the Peterson experts have been right that the economy is slowing gradually, that we're not seeing that we, uh, we're not going to see a sharp slowdown, and we expect that to continue, uh, you know, basically reflecting uh, the growth of the service sector in China. Um, for India, a bit of a pickup <clears throat> last year was held back by the demonetization and by uh, the sales tax that was put in place by the, in, in the middle of last year, but growth should pick up to be brisker there. And then Russia and Brazil um, have kind of decidedly moved into recoveries, um, although uh, for Brazil there is uncertainty surrounding the um, election this fall. Okay, so now let me dig in on the U.S. Uh, this, this slide just summarizes my forecast. As you can see, and by the way, I've switched here to Q4 over Q4 growth rates, but as you can see, I'm looking for a um, pickup in growth uh, in uh, this year to 2.8% um, before growth comes down in 2019 to a pace that's still above trend at 2.3%, um, but then declining further in 2020 to 1.6%. Uh, um, and accordingly, I'm looking for the unemployment rate to continue to fall to, in fact, uh, bottom out at 3.5% uh, next year before turning up again. And um, as I'll discuss later in the talk, I'm looking for inflation to um, overshoot uh, the Fed's target uh, modestly. Okay, so the contour for the U.S. is shaped... Um, <clears throat> significantly by what's going on fiscally. And so let me elaborate on that. Um, so part of that story, a big part of that story is tax reform. And what I'm showing on the left here is just the, uh, the change in tax payments uh, that is uh, forecasted uh, as, uh, as resulting from the 2017 tax reform. And basically what you can see uh, in this chart is you can see that personal or individual and, and business tax cuts um, are uh, you know reducing payments? Uh, there is some offset from um, higher tax revenues related to repatriation of foreign earnings. Um, you can see that there is um, 
a kind of decent decline in payments this year from the baseline. Um, and then the decline in payments gets larger next year. Um, but then it starts to shrink again. So uh, this year it's a boost to growth. Next year it's a boost to growth. But then it becomes um, a negative for growth. Um, on, the, on the right, what I'm showing is um, kind of the deficit effects with and without dynamic scoring. Uh, this is just really to forecast or foreshadow where I'm coming out, which is that most independent experts think that the macro effects of this tax reform are going to be pretty small, and that's reflected in the fact that the revenues um, don't change that much with the macro feedback. I'm showing um, TPC's uh, estimates here. Uh, if you were to look at J JCT, you'd see somewhat bigger macro effect, um, but really across the independent forecasters, um, all of the changes are small-ish. Um, so then the other piece of fiscal stimulus is um, from the spending side, and I'm showing you here what I expect in terms of um, kind of discretionary spending uh, as well as CBO's ba baseline last summer. Um, so, so what we, we know is we know the amount by which um, the caps changed uh, for this fiscal year and next fiscal year. That's not telling you how spending is going to change because you have to make assumptions about kind of the lag with which spending occurs. Um, and you have to also make assumptions about, um, you know, some of the, how some of the non-discretionary categories like overseas con contingency uh, operations, how that spending is changing. And the legislation only uh, covered 2018, 2019, so you have to make some assumption about uh, 2020. And there I am assuming that we're not going to go back to the original caps, that the caps will be increased for 2020 as well. Um, I should note that uh, as much as a surprise, uh, as much as many people viewed uh, spending uh, coming out of this package as uh, surprisingly high, um, it's still going to be smaller relative to GDP than uh, in almost any year since the early 1960s. So you shouldn't be looking for a big supply side effect of um, the, the, fis the spending package either. Okay, so just here's where I come out after kind of crunching the numbers. Uh, the chart at the left shows effects on the level of GDP, and there are pairs of bars for 2018, 2019, 2020. Uh, the bar on the left is basically the direct effects um, of the lower tax revenues and the higher spending. Um, and then the bar on the right in each pair, the gray bar, is basically what happens when I put the multipliers on, and really effectively that's really just the, the Fed reaction that I'm putting on there. But not surprisingly, what you see is that putting the multipliers in, it shrinks the impact of uh, the fiscal reforms. But you still see a boost to growth this year, um, a boost, uh, or sorry, a boost to the level this year, um, a somewhat higher boost to the level next year. But then the boost to the level in 2020 is really much smaller. So that's reflected in what you see on the right, which is translating those numbers over to the Q4 over Q4 real GDP growth rate, where you see for 2018, I think the fiscal changes um, will add uh, six tenths GDP growth. Um, for 2019, it's one tenth, but then it's a drag of a little more than half a percentage point in 2020. And I should note that this is all re relative to a counterfactual uh, where fiscal policy is neutral for GDP. So spending and tax revenues are, are kind of staying the same as a share of GDP. And that's important because you could have a different baseline, like basically what you were expecting like last fall, uh, and you'd get a different answer. Okay, so um, with that said, let me just briefly run through the various sectors of the U.S. economy. Um, for consumption, I think the fundamentals continue to look very strong. Um, so one thing that's drawn note recently is the very low level of the personal saving rate, which you can see on the left in this chart. Um, yes, it's very low, but it's um, to be expected given how much net worth has climbed. And it is true that this chart ends in uh, the end of last year. And so we will see net worth uh, kind of decline in the first quarter of this year, but it's not going to change that story much. Um, more broadly, household balance sheets are just much cleaner than they were prior to the crisis. And I put uh, the household debt service ratio in here as kind of a summary statistic for that. But really, what you want to do is you want to go look at the microdata. And the microdata tells you the same story. For, so for example, you can look in the SCF and you can look at how many households have uh, debt service payments that are um, uh, you know, more than 40% of their pre-tax income, that series is also very low. It's like down lower than it was um, at any point since 2004. Okay, um, housing sector, I have to say I 
follow the housing sector pretty closely, and I've been doing that for years. Um, I have to say, I've just been, and I see Roz, my partner from Treasury over there, I just have continued to have been, I've, I was baffled for years about the par housing sector, why we didn't see kind of a faster recovery in that sector. And I know there are stories, and I think this is true, that for some people, there are kind of constraints on their ability to uh, form households and buy homes. Um, so those are constraining demand, but when you look at prices on the right, what you see is brisk, continued brisk growth in prices. Um, so that's not a signal that demand for the economy as a whole for housing is weak. Um, so what this all leads me to believe is that supply side factors are pretty important and they've been kind of the binding constraint on home construction in recent years, which leads me to think that we're gonna, I expect to see more of the same, just a continued slow movement upward. Um, and to the extent that we see higher in interest rates reflected in housing construction, I really, or in the housing sector, I really think it's going to show up in prices rather than in activity. Um, business investment uh, has gotten its groove back, um, and uh, you know it had these weak years. It's gone back up, um, and I expect that to persist. You know, some of that is um, the corporate tax cuts. Uh, and just the perception of a more business-friendly uh, uh, administrati administration and uh, the policies that might come with that. Um, I think we shouldn't dismiss the kind of um, the impact of a much stronger global economy on business investment. And I stuck the ISM index on there, it's the blue line on the left, just to show that new export orders, even with Monday's down ticks, that, that index was just much higher than it was before. Okay. So um, speaking of net exports, um, I'm penciling in kind of a moderate drag from net exports in coming years. That's to be expected given how much fiscal stimulus will be in our economy. Um, you know, I just, uh, you know, one thing people have been remarking on is, well, you know, with this fiscal uh, stimulus story, isn't it surprising the dollar hasn't um, climbed since that happened? Um, there are various theories for why it has not. I don't have time to go into them. What I can say is that the level of the dollar is um, pretty high right now. Okay, um, so that takes us through the demand side. Uh, a couple of comments on the labor market. The labor market is tight. I think it's getting tighter. Uh, you know, one thing that um, we've been talking about for several years now is that, you know, the range of payroll gains that's consistent with the longer run growth of the labor force, that's like something like 100,000 or maybe a little bit less than 100,000. And we just keep seeing these months that are, you know, 200,000 job growth, and that's a really striking thing, uh, and that is tightening the labor market further. We can see the unemployment rate on the right has fallen to kind of the bottom of the range uh, that most people, uh, the very bottom of the range that people are citing for the natural rate. Um, I think there's probably a little slack left in labor force participation. Uh, Jacob's going to talk about this further. Um, but basically, you know, if you look at overall participa participation, which is what I'm showing on the left, you can see that that series, the level is not particularly high right now. That might suggest a lot of slack. But you need to recognize that retiring baby boomers are contributing maybe, um, you know, point, uh, a quarter percentage point every single year to this downtrend, this kind of natural downtrend in the overall labor force participation rate. So what you really want to do is look at prime age. And you can see there that prime age labor force participation, it has started to come back as the labor market has tightened. It's not where it was pre-recession, suggesting perhaps some more slack there. We need to remember that there is a longer term downtrend in prime age labor force participation. So maybe it will go back uh, to its pre-recession average, but that's kind of the optimistic uh, view of the picture. Um, but even, even with that, it gives you a little more slack, a little more time to run with payroll gains um, uh, above 100,000, uh, but not that much more time, which is why I am expecting that um, uh, that wage growth will, in fact, accelerate from here and reach 3%. I should say that doesn't necessarily mean it's automatically going to, cheat, uh, to translate into price pressures. Uh, we need to remember that um, the profit share is high. Uh, the labor share, or, or uh, similarly, the labor compensation share of national income has come down a bunch. So there should be room in profits to increase rate wages um, you know, without increasing prices. Okay, so 
Uh, speaking of prices, here's my, uh, my inflation forecast. This is percent change from 12 months earlier in the headline PCE and core PCE. It just shows you the modest overshooting that I am uh, forecasting. Uh, it gets up as high as 2.2%. I should say if this line were extended further, it would not continue to climb much above there. Uh, before it comes down again. You can see some interesting uh, kind of near-term dynamics. Those are just kind of arithmetically uh, popping out of kind of very high levels that we had a year ago that are now, uh, we're moving beyond. Okay, so uh, in the background behind this, of course, is monetary policy. Um, here you can see on the left the effective federal funds rate. You can see uh, that I am expecting it to um, normalize. It, this path is not that different from what the, the Fed itself or the FOMC itself is predicting. Um, there will be some overshooting. Uh, the equilibrium rate, which is what I'm showing on this chart, I think it's lower than where we're ending up in 2020, and that's just because of the economy running hotter uh, for a little bit. Um, and you can see that the Treasury yield on the right is also projected to come up. Um, not by as much. I'm actually leaving the kind of term premium uh, lower than it's been historically, and that's because I think underlying demand for Treasury Treasuries uh, remains pretty um, strong. Um, the other thing I put on this line is just the longer term average of interest rates. That's I put it there not because I expect it's indicative, not because it's indicative of where I think rates are going, but rather just as a reminder that we're ending up in a place that's considerably lower than we've been historically, which is going to be a challenge for, mon for monetary policy in this country and other countries as well uh, with the next downturn. Okay, so last two slides, I just want to quickly mention um, the risks that I think are, that are out there. Um, I wrote uh, this slide uh, a couple of days ago, so um, I didn't know what was going to happen overnight with China. Uh, but basically, um, my view is that we've seen only skirmishes at this point, not wars. And I think uh, Mark said that's exactly the language he was going to use as well. Um, but there is a risk that either we take more protectionist uh, steps, and one reason being that the current account uh, deficit, which I'm showing here, it hasn't gone anywhere. And if anything, it's likely to increase over the next couple of years because of the fiscal stimulus. Um, or just because kind of more protectionism sells well with the, with the base. Um, but another risk, and this has been highlighted uh, with events of the last 24 hours, is that other countries get fed up with the United States and put more retaliatory measures in place. Okay, so um, the second risk that I want to um, highlight is just um, the chance that uh, the overshooting that we see in the economy, like I said, I'm expecting something that's a modest overshooting, the GDP rises a bit above potential and inflation will modestly overshoot its target, that the overshooting uh, will be either larger or more difficult uh, to correct than we currently anticipate. Um, so right now, we, the economy is going to require a period of cooling off in 2020 and 20, 2021. We're going to see a rise in the unemployment rate. There has been a lot of talk um, that has um, kind of correctly pointed out that when the employment rate, unemployment rate rises by a few tenths, um, you know, or more than a few tenths, that normally puts us into a recession. That's been true in the post-war period. Um, but we need to remember that that point, uh, you know, might not be that applicable because there have those periods when uh, a rise in the unemployment rate uh, led to a full-fledged recession, those were also periods when the Fed was raising rates to adjust already high inflation or the economy suffered some other shock. Um, so what we're going to come out here is that um, it's not a foregone conclu conclusion that the correction will be tough, but we are in uncharted territory, and so that is a risk to the economic outlook. Um, okay, so that's what I have to say. I guess as we would say at the board, that concludes my prepared remarks, um, and I will turn things over to Jacob. Well, thank you very much, Karen. Um, I should say from the outset that I am acutely aware that I am uh, on this sort of August day of 1914 in the global trading system is what stands between you and the PIAE's war correspondent, uh, Mark Nolan. So I will be very brief in what I have to say since it just basically are on uh, boring issues about wages and wage restraint, yesterday's story, uh, uh, so we can get to Mark as quickly as possible. Um, but what, what I really, it's also a fairly straightforward story, actually. 
uh, uh, that builds very uh, directly from a lot of what Karen just said. Uh, as you said at the outset, uh, that I will be discussing nominal wages. Uh, there is a lot of reasons for that, but basically, in my opinion, it is the most relevant metric to debate in periods of low but positive inflation, which is what we're in now in advanced economies. So I want to talk a little bit about what, what uh, Karen also mentioned, which is that wage inflation, not just in the United States, but really across the advanced economies, has been very weak uh, in the face of, in fact, also outside the United States, tightening standard measures of uh, uh, labor market. Uh, so then I want to talk a little bit about broader measures of labor market slack, uh, the sort of equivalent of what in the US is known as U6 for also the Euro area, Germany and Japan to the extent that one can create such uh, a data series, and then uh, a few uh, conclusions at the end. Um, but basically, you know, this is basically Karen's chart. I just averaged out all the different metrics, uh, uh, different wage indicators in the United States. That suggests that, uh, you know, we really have been below our pre-global uh, financial crisis uh, uh, level. Um, and we haven't breached uh, uh, 3% yet, and in fact, the latest data suggests that we may be further from it than expected. Uh, if you throw in Japan, uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that, that Japan seems to be stuck at, at close to but below 1% uh, um, nominal wage growth. Uh, this is total uh, weekly wages, uh, total weekly cash wages, uh, and the big drop you will see during the financial crisis is basically that Japanese firms did away with uh, annual and or, or regularized uh, cash bonuses. Uh, but this includes uh, uh, cash bonuses. So even with them, uh, you know, we're pretty close, uh, uh, not, not to zero, but certainly 1%. Um, the euro area looks somewhere in between, though slightly closer to the United States uh, than Japan. But I mean, if you borrow another term again, you could say that wages also seem to be stuck close to but below 2%. Um, and that is actually true uh, even in Germany, as we will come back to a little later. Um, and this is, this is quite surprising, uh, uh, because if you look at this is just a standard unemployment rate in the United States, you will see that we're now back not only at pre-crisis level, but actually at the levels last seen in the United States during the sort of high-powered labor market of the late 1990s. Um, it's true in Japan as well, but we have to go back to pre-bubble era periods of the 1990, uh, 1980s to get to these levels. Uh, and it's increasingly true even in the Eurozone, where we are back now to pre-crisis averages for the Euro area. And if you look at the path of the US and the Euro area, uh, unemployment rate, you will actually see that the path of decline, the speed of decline in the euro area, actually in the last four years has been the same as it was after 2011 in the United States. Uh, so, so it is a, in some ways a bit surprising that we have seen, haven't seen anything even in the euro area by this metric. Um, and this is, this is at a period where uh, labor force participation is picking up. Uh, even in the United States, uh, uh, which means that the critique that you often hear in Europe, at least, about some of the unemployment declines in the United <laughs> States that says, oh, it's because of declining labor force participation, that critique is no longer valid for the United States. Um, and it's demonstratively not because of that in Japan, uh, where I think it's fair to say that one of the areas in which Abenomics clearly seems to have been working is uh, uh, labor force participation. I mean, there's something is really happening here. I should also point out that in contrast, for, for comparative purposes, reasons, I'm using the uh, six, 15 to 64 year age category, not the one that, that Karen uh, uh, mentioned. Um, and it's also true in the Euro area, uh, uh, where, uh, you know, labor force participation has also been rising. Uh, so we you know it, it, it is a bit of a conundrum why we haven't seen uh, uh, wage inflation or wage demands at least at the levels we saw pre-crisis. Um, so if you look at the standard metrics, that is. So what I now want to do is try to look at the broader measures, uh, and the one that's most widely used in the United States is is U6, uh, where basically you add in other categories of marginally attached, discouraged workers, and those people working part-time 
but for economic reasons. So it's basically attempts to have a broader metric, not of, of full-time unemployment, but of underemployment uh, in the economy. And if you do that uh, uh, for the United States, you, you can see that as of the last couple of quarters, we are in fact now back to uh, the levels that we saw pre-crisis, which some of the previous slides ago showed you was commensurate with in 2006, 2007, sort of nominal wage increases in the three and a half percent range. Uh, uh, so, so the bottom line is I, I think, uh, and I concur with what uh, Karen said, that there's no reason to believe that the US isn't going to be moving uh, uh, in that direction fairly soon. Now, if you try to do something similar with Japan, you run up to the issue that getting comparable uh, labor force survey questions and data is it's a little trickier. So what I did here was that I looked through uh, at this and found some roughly comparable uh, uh, data uh, for people first here, those who are not in the labor force and therefore not counted in unemployment rate, but actually wants to work. Uh, there can be many reasons for why they're not in the labor force. They can be, you know, they can be in education or, or other things. Uh, but that, that, as you can see, is, is a pretty uh, significant chunk. Uh, and then there are those uh, people, and this is a functional equivalent, as I hope to create at least, of uh, uh, those who are working part-time for economic reasons in the US. These are people in Japan that have a job, but haven't been able to get a regular uh, job, so they're working either part-time, irregular jobs, et cetera. And that, again, as you can see, is, is a fairly sizable chunk. Uh, so while time series can't be created, and therefore we can't really say where we are relative to uh, uh, pre-crisis, it's fair to say that the overall levels here suggest relative to the United States, which was about 8% uh, U6, that the levels, even though they've been coming down in Japan, are actually still uh, significantly uh, higher. If you do the same in the euro area, uh, and those of you who follow this will know that Peter Pred and the ECB have been, have been doing this uh, for some time. Uh, you, you can use, you can construct similar type of broader measures, uh, uh, and which I did here. Uh, uh, and you will see that we are uh, not, and just a way of expression, I tried at the end here to project uh, what needed to happen uh, to get back to pre-crisis levels uh, for this broader measure of underemployment in the euro era. Uh, uh, and if, in order to get there, you have to go uh, to 2020, which is a short way of saying that actually by this uh, metric, the overall euro area has very ample slack uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, labor market, notwithstanding the, the earlier data. Um, so. What does this tell you? Well, it certainly tells you that even broader, uh, uh, that the broader measures of unemployment are uh, diverging quite significantly. Uh, uh, and for the United States, uh, as I said earlier, I think the evidence suggests that we should be looking at uh, higher nominal wage uh, growth in the uh, uh, imminent future. But there are uncertainties, right? I mean, I don't think uh, we should expect nominal wages to necessarily surge if unemployment, oh, sorry, if, if uh, Productivity remains very low. Uh, some argue that it is because of, of, of lower US unionization rates. That may play a role, but it's very difficult to make that argument relative to the world of 2006, 2007, where unionization in the US or even in the late 1990s was already very low. Uh, uh, then there are issues sort of non-compete clauses and firm concentration and monopsony power in local that may also play a, a role and then the, the overall gig economy. Uh, uh, but, but anyway, the bottom line for me in the U.S. is that we should see higher wages uh, 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 coming fairly soon. Uh, in Japan, on the other hand, uh, I think the broader uh, uh, measures of underemployment suggest that there is actually, despite these very impressive increases in labor force participation and declines in under, on, unemployment, that there is actually uh, a still fairly ample room in, in terms of significant slack in the economy, which means that I don't believe that wages are going to pick up uh, uh, in Japan uh, anytime soon. Uh, and then there is also these other uncertainty issues that, you know, Bank of Japan Governor Kuroda continuously talks about the deflationary mindset. I mean, the idea that if you've gone through a period of falling prices for a very long time, then you don't 
uh, necessary. You think that's the new normal, so to speak, and therefore you don't uh, ask for uh, nominal rates or nominal wage increases because why? Ha why do you have to if, if prices are coming down? Uh, so there are some uncertainties there, but, but bottom line, I think uh, uh, it's fair to say that the continuing struggle that the Abe government has had to get firms to raise uh, uh, their wages will continue. Now, if you look at the euro area, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, these broader measures of underemployment certainly diverge dramatically inside the euro area. Uh, and the one that I think is probably most relevant uh, is the German one, which is the one I have here, uh, which shows that the sort of equivalent of German U6 abroad underemployment is now actually not too far from uh, US levels of about 8%. Uh, and this clearly matters because in many ways, Germany is the inflation anchor uh, in the Euro area. Uh, uh, and I think one of the things that the Euro crisis showed is that countries diverge from German uh, uh, wage and inflation levels uh, at their, too much at their peril. So the idea here, of course, is that if Germany could at the same, similar to the United States, be on the cusp of, of a higher sustained nominal wage growth, that would be good for rebalancing uh, in the Euro area and wage growth uh, in the rest of the uh, Euro area. However, uh, I am somewhat less optimistic than that because this is what you get if you show the long-term uh, uh, trend of German negotiated wages and actual take-home pay. Um, and you will see that even though the German labor markets are by many metrics as tight as the ones we have in Japan now, we're stuck at close to but below 2%. Uh, the latest negotiated wage settlement this year in the car industry or in the metals industry in Baden-Württemberg suggested that you may, we may get something above 4% nominal wage increases. Uh, um, that would clearly be uh, a significant uh, a jump upwards if uh, such a wage settlement was replicated across the economy. I, I am, however, quite skeptical that this will, uh, that this will happen. Uh, and I think it is indicative also that, uh, uh, you know, the metals industry in Baden-Württemberg is probably the area in the euro area where unions right now are the strongest. Uh, it's absolutely full employment. Uh, IG Metall dominates the uh, sector. Uh, uh, so they should be in a position to ask for a lot more if they want it. They settled for 4% under these circumstances that are as benign as I think you can imagine them. But they also asked for other things. They wanted actually not to go, not, not just to 35 hours work weeks, but to 28 hour work weeks. Uh, they wanted uh, uh, flexibility, work-life balance, call it whatever you want, instead of wages. And if that is what the unions in the strongest negotiating position in Europe are also asking for, I don't think we should expect, uh, you know, 4% nationwide in Germany, and therefore I don't expect German wages to, to create a significant boost uh, for the euro area as a whole either. Uh, what this leaves me with is, as I said, underemployment uh, levels are diverging. Uh, uh, the U.S. should I believe, begin to accelerate, but that is certainly not, in my opinion, the case in either Japan or the Euro area. And as I said, I don't think German will be a locomotive, Germany will be a locomotive for uh, uh, Euro area wage growth in the coming years. And this has fairly straightforward implications for monetary policy, in my opinion, where I suspect that both the Bank of Japan and the ECB will struggle to reach their uh, inflation targets, uh, even in the medium term. Thank you. And, and now, as they used to say on Monty Python, and now for something completely different. Um, I've been asked to discuss how trade policy might affect macroeconomic outcomes. That's a somewhat unusual topic because we don't normally think of trade policy being linked to macro outcomes. Normally, we think of trade policy really involving distribution. And indeed, in my remarks, distributional issues will feature prominently. These remarks uh, will 
draw in significant part upon the work of some of my Peterson colleagues, Chad Bown, Sherman Robinson, Karen Thierfelder, who are all here today. And I would also like to give a shout out to Melina Kolb and Daniel Hausch, who constructed the maps that I'm going to show in a moment. I told somebody I, I feel like the front man in a band. I get all the glory and attention uh, while my colleagues labor in the shadows. Actually, I feel more like the guy in Money for Nothing. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing this gig for 30 years. I have yet to see any groupies, any, any drugs. I, I should have learned to play the guitar. <laughs> anyway, what I'm gonna do in my remaining time is briefly survey um, uh, the current situation and then, talk, then sketch out two broad scenarios going forward. Well, where, where are we now? Donald Trump was elected president on an explicitly protectionist platform in his inaugural address, and I'm quoting him here, he said, we must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. Protection will lead to great prosperity and strength. And this tendency has been evident since the first week in office where he pulled the United States out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a terrible own goal. The administration has attempted to negotiate existing free tra trade agreements, most prominently the uh, Chorus Agreement with South Korea, as well as NAFTA with Mexico and Canada. And in both cases, the administration has sought to weaken the agreements to enable more protection, rather than to strengthen the agreements to achieve uh, greater uh, foreign market and access. So for example, in the case of Chorus, the recently concluded deal caps at 70% of uh, a, the last three years average, the amount of steel that uh, Korea can ship to the United States. And it lengthens the implementation time on a reduction of tariffs uh, of small pickup trucks uh, from uh, 10 to uh, uh, 30 years. Similarly, uh, weakening of NAFTA is expected to be an outcome of that negotiation. Beyond renegotiating existing agreements, new protection has been applied. Um, it has taken the form of anti-dumping actions, countervailing duty cases, and rarely used global safeguard and national security measures. Section 301, which was retained in US law after the Uruguay Around Agreement of the uh, World Trade Organization uh, to impose retaliation in WTO authorized cases has been uninterred to deal with unfair trade. Products such as washing machines, solar cells, steel and aluminum have received protection, and uh, new protection for a wide range of products may be a result if uh, an agreement cannot be reached between the United States and China in a dispute regarding intellectual property and technology transfer. At the, um, uh, my colleague Chad Bown has calculated the share of US imports subject to special protection measures. And at the end of 2017, about 4% of US imports and about 9% of imports from China were subject to uh, special protection. He calculated uh, last year that if all the cases underway at that time uh, were uh, to result in a protection being applied, that share would roughly double. Um, the current situation is fluid. The administration is handing out exemptions in uh, the case, or temporary exemptions in the, in the steel case and it's unclear how those will ultimately be resolved. And importantly, uh, it has initiated a Section 301 case uh, on intellectual property and technology transfer in China. So I think it's fair to say when taking both of those effects into account, we're still probably on a trajectory to roughly double the share of imports under special protection. Yesterday, the administration announced a list uh, considered for retaliation in the Section 301 case and today the Chinese responded with their own counter retaliation list of products, US products slated for a 25% tariff. When I looked at it last night, the US list looked just pretty much like a scatter shot across the manufacturing sector. Although in fairness, the administration says that what it is trying to do is target for protection sectors which the Chinese are promoting using industrial policies under their China 2025 uh, program. Um, interestingly, the US list excludes textiles, apparel, and shoes. It does, however, include many capital goods 
used in the production of textiles, apparel, and shoes. And uh, the list is subject to public comment. It is not final. But uh, the upshot is, by not protecting apparel and shoes, and then protecting the inputs to apparel and shoes, if the list goes through, then what the administration will have done is impose negative effective protection on uh, the domestic uh, textile and apparel sector. And they will be punished, much like steel using industries in the United States are being punished by the steel tariff. <laughs> on the bright side, the list also includes pistols, rifles, shotguns, grenades, rocket launchers, flamethrowers, artillery, and torpedoes. So the price of cheap imported artillery and torpedoes may well be rising. I'm sure the NRA will be pleased, representing the interest of domestic manufacturers. Uh, the Trump administration has shown uh, an unprecedented tendency to self-initiate these sorts of cases. And that's important because historically, self-initiated cases uh, are more likely to result in protection, and the protective margins applied in those cases are likely to be um, higher. And in the case of China, uh, if these uh, patterns hold, then the share of Chinese imports under protection in the U.S. market will again more than double, in this case from about 9% to 21% on Chad's calculations. Um, Imposition of protection on this scale would be bad for the U.S. economy, but it would not have a notable, or it's unlikely to have a, a notable macroeconomic activity. The gradual imp uh, imposition of protection, as I've described, um, will encourage misallocation of resources, it will disrupt supply chains, it will increase uncertainty, disrupting investment, and the net, the, the net result will b be to put downward pressure on productivity growth. And I would liken it to a termites in the foundation or the frog in the pot of water situation where what has begun is a process where at no one point in time does it, does it raise alarms, but if sustained over a long period of time could be catastrophic. Um, that's true overall, but it's not necessarily true for specific regions of the country. Back in 2016, Sherman Robinson, Tyler Moran, and I did some modeling on uh, trade wars. And one of the things we did was look at uh, scenarios in which Chinese retaliation was limited to specific sectors, as well as a scenario in which the Chinese uh, retaliated across the board. Two of the possible sectors for Chinese retaliation that we looked at were uh, soybeans and aircraft and aircraft parts and they are prominent on the list that China announced today. I should also mention in passing that we looked at another scenario, which I think is interesting, which is that China could retaliate against US business service providers by essentially telling state-owned enterprise uh, enterprises to stop purchasing, uh, Ameri you know, stop buying American business services, and that could be done uh, sort of you know, under the radar uh, and is something worth keeping an eye on going forward. Anyway, in the soybean scenario, uh, we calculated that Chinese embargo on uh, uh, U.S. soybeans would result in a temporary loss of 111,000 jobs. I say temporary because in past cases of agricultural embargoes, it, take, it basically takes a harvest cycle uh, for the markets to recalibrate. And in the case of soybeans, it could be complicated because many of the major alternative suppliers are in the southern hemisphere and the growing seasons are different. Um, if retaliation took uh, the form of a 25% tariff, which it turns out is not prohibitive, then obviously it would have a milder impact, but the same geographical incidence. Now the map um, that I've put up there uh, is, uh, shows the uh, states experiencing the greatest relative private sector employment loss uh, in this scenario, and two points stand out. First, uh, product uh, uh, specific retaliation may be felt quite unevenly across the country. In this scenario, the state of Mississippi loses more than 13,000 jobs, and there are more, of, more than a dozen Mississippi counties that experience direct and indirect private sector employment losses exceeding 10%. And there's one county that actually uh, uh, loses 25% of its jobs. It wouldn't be surprising to me, given that these counties are contiguous, that in that kind of scenario, you would see the failure of some small financial um, uh, uh, institutions, but it is unlikely to have anything, uh, an impact big enough to have um, an impact on the macro level nationally. The other point that may be worth underscoring is the political economy of trade 
conflict. In this case, if you look at that map, the most affected states are largely the so-called red states that voted for President Trump. That, together with uh, the European Union's threat in the Steele case to retaliate against products associated with the constituencies of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and uh, House uh, Speaker Paul Ryan, reminds us that the other governments, you know, the foreign governments, get to play this game too. And uh, they have the capacity to direct pain in a politically discretionary manner. Now, another product on the Chinese list is aircraft. Sherman and I calculated that a Chinese termination of aircraft purchases could destroy uh, 179,000 U.S. jobs. U.S. aircraft production is highly concentrated, and the worst uh, affected areas would be the Seattle metropolitan area, which includes Everett, Washington, the Los Angeles metropolitan area, Wichita, Kansas, and Dallas, Texas, as well as, as some other places around the country. Now, the actual impact uh, would depend on the uh, Chinese ability to shift purchases, which would be greater for small aircraft and parts than it would be for wide-body jets. Uh, and uh, what the Chinese have announced so far is a 25% tariff, not a complete uh, termination of purchases. Uh, but again, it gives you some sense of where the pain would be felt in these uh, scenarios. Now, the scenarios that, that I've discussed thus far might be considered trade skirmishes, um, but trade wars with a more appreciable macroeconomic impact are possible. Um, and our focus is on China, though it should be said that more inclusive trade wars involving more protagonists are certainly possible. The likelihood of such an outcome occurring will rise if the uh, cyclical I had global cyclical recovery, but now I know I'm supposed to call it global cyclical boom, uh, contributes to a widening of the U.S. trade deficit. And the Trump administration is tempted to impose additional protection in a quixotic attempt to square the circle. Uh, this morning, uh, President Trump tweeted, and I'm quoting, though I won't be able to do it full justice, um, when you're already 500 billion down, that's in caps, you can't lose, exclamation point. Well, actually, you can. Um, ooh, that map is a, that, that's kind of dark. We'll have to work on that. Um, in our trade war modeling, uh, Sherman Tyler and I found that a major trade war with China and Mexico involving the imposition of across-the-board tariffs by the United States and symmetrical response by those countries could have a recessionary impact on the United States, significantly affecting uh, uh, industries uh, that produce capital goods, for example, both because of the uh, direct impact of loss of export markets, but also in the recession and the decline in domestic investment, the capital goods industries would suffer because their uh, uh, investment uses them intensively. The worst affected state would be Washington state. They get it in, in almost all ways, agriculture, aircraft, business services in the Port of Tacoma. Um, but other states, including in the Midwest, that you would not necessarily think of as being particularly exposed to trade, also get hurt through this indirect effect on domestic investment. And one of the things we found that was striking about the modeling was how that shock reverberated through the economy. Non-traded sectors such as wholesale and retail trade, temporary employment agencies, and so on, are hit very hard. Those sectors tend to hire people of relatively low, low education uh, at, at relatively low wage rates. So the net labor market effect of, of this kind of trade war would be regressive. It would hit the most vulnerable people in the society um, the hardest. Um, and as I was reminded this morning, uh, China owns an estimated 1.2 trillion of U.S. treasuries. Uh, I've always been skeptical of the uh, kind of, uh, you know, that use, the use of financial markets in a trade war, war because that, you know, selling those securities would be the financial market equivalent of mutual assured destruction. But I think it is worth, worth keeping in mind that there could be financial market implications for these actions uh, as well as effects on goods and services. Now, since, what, since we did our work focusing on the U.S., Sherman and Karen uh, Thierfelder have been, in essence, globalizing this work, putting together a static global computable general equilibrium model to examine trade war scenarios globally. And I'm going to show you one map 
Um, this is, they've looked at a variety of scenarios, but just to give you a sense of what their research is producing, this is a map of world trade under a scenario in which the United States uh, raises its tariffs 30 percentage points and all regions uh, respond uh, in kind. Admittedly, that's an extreme scenario. I, I doubt it will obtain, but it is useful just in, in thinking about how these effects are non-uniform. So you see in that scenario, the worst affected area is the United States. Canada and Mexico, because of their high trade dependence in the United States, are badly affected. Asia, uh, because of its relatively high uh, trade exposure, and Latin America, because of its relative uh, orientation to the, towards the United States, are also you know, badly affected, while Europe and areas that trade heavily with Europe or don't trade much at all, such as Africa, South Asia, and the Middle East, are relatively uh, insulated from the effect. Um, we, Sherman and Karen did another scenario where they just look at US-China bilateral uh, trade war. And one of the interesting things is that in that case, unlike this one where everyone loses trade uh, and income, in that case, there may be regions that actually benefit from trade diversion. It could see a modest increase in trade and uh, uh, income. In economic terms, trade skirmishes are less costly than trade wars, and there is a natural inclination to hope that both sides act cautiously. And I, I'm sure that we all share that. But in conclusion, I would like to leave you with a final thought that on the surface is reassuring, but on a deeper level may be profoundly disturbing. Historically, China has been willing to retaliate against the United States in trade disputes, and they uh, uh, signaled their willingness to do it in this situation by responding within one day with their own counter-retaliation uh, list. And in some ways, that willingness to retaliate may have actually been good, because to the extent that being subject to retaliation um, might actually damper rash policy. But retaliation also raises the prospect of escalatory cycles, and so naturally, observers hope that uh, both sides show uh, restraint. But I think it's possible in the current circumstances that the real long-run threat to U.S. interests is less the Kindleberger spiral than the Ali Ropadope. In his first week in office, Donald Trump pulled the United States out of TPP, which amounted to a self-inflicted wound. The U.S. TPP would not have only made U.S.-style trade liberalization the centerpiece for trade liberalization in the Asia-Pacific, but the agreements, uh, requirements regarding labor market reform uh, and uh, reform of state-owned enterprises uh, would have posed a real challenge to China uh, in political and economic terms uh, were China to attempt to uh, join the agreement. As a consequence, I believe the Chinese political leadership must have been breathing a great sigh of relief when Trump pulled the United States out of TPP and obviated the Chinese need to face those challenges. Since then, uh, the president, U.S. policy has in significant part alienated foreign publics and their government. It may well be the case that China regards the erosion of U.S. standing under this administration as in its long-run interests. And whatever the short-run challenges posed by the erratic nature of the Trump administration, uh, instead of responding in a full tit-for-tat manner, China may actually calibrate carefully its retaliation, showing enough retaliation to save face, but not so much to damage uh, Trump's political interests. And indeed, I've had Chinese diplomats in private conversations say as much. The real threat may not be trade wars, but a sustained degradation of U.S. leadership and values. We may be the frog in the water that does not grasp that it is being cooked. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to our discussion.
like you, as usual, we'll have a roaming mic up front, a standing mic at the back of the room. If you could please uh, state your name and affiliation when you ask a question, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. And if you could actually ask a question, that would be even more appreciated. So we have questions here. Hi, Joe Bullio from Brevin Howard. Um, in your discussion on you know, monetary policy and the outlook, you really didn't address anything regarding R star, that kind of concept. I was wondering if you could comment on that and specifically the idea that US debt and federal government borrowing is going to soar. Um, can you, okay, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, so over the period that I'm looking at, I am um, assuming that R star is um, going to be kind of in the three percent uh, range, um, and uh, you know I have uh, rates going up a little higher than that. That's just to reflect um, kind of the overshooting of the economy and the need to raise rates. Uh, uh, a little bit over that to um, kind of correct the overshooting. Um, you know, I think it's, I think we don't know. Uh, I mean, I think you're raising a good point about uh, increased borrowing. Um, I think uh, we can't be sure as to how it's going to turn out, but um, my, um, so, and that could be an upside risk to the equilibrium rate. I think it's still going to remain kind of below where it was historically, and that is still going to be a challenge for monetary policy going forward. Barry Wood, RTHK in Hong Kong. Marcus, let me ask you, um, in the context of these measures that the United States is proposing against China, what scenario do you think is most likely as it unfolds? It's interesting that there's a 45, 60-day period of discussion, public hearings. What forum would you expect negotiations between the two parties to occur? And what do you think that uh, the administration really wants from the Chinese in terms of measures to prevent these from going into effect? I'm going to give you an answer, which is my understanding of the situation, and is an honest answer, though I think you may find it um, unbelievable or unsatisfying. Uh, first of all, um, I have had uh, some limited contact with um, administration officials. I cannot get them to articulate what their ask is. I can't get them to say, what is it you want the Chinese to do? Well, we want the Chinese to stop having an industrial policy, or we want the Chinese to stop Vision 2025 or something. You know, how will we know that we won? How will we know that we got what we want? We can't get them to articulate that. Then I say, okay, so what's the mechanism that we're going to get it? What, what are the negotiations? What are the markers? What is the timeline? Can't articulate it. All they can articulate is we're going to that, that that negotiations for 15 years. Here's the talking point: negotiations have we've negotiated for 15 years and it's failed, and now we're going to hit them with this. There's there's nothing else. So I mentioned in passing that the administration touts as one of its accomplishments something I would regard as a failure which is that they have extended the time period on the uh, deprotection of small pickup trucks in the U.S. market in chorus from 10 years to 30 years. Some of you may not realize that, that small pickup trucks in the U.S. market are subject to a 25% tariff. That's why you don't see you know, Toyota pickup trucks in the United States, whereas you see them everywhere else in the world. That 25% tariff came out of the chicken war that we had with Europe back in, I believe, 1963. That was supposed to be a temporary thing. And so when asked, 
well, what is the mechanism by which the United States will declare victory and remove these tariffs that you're contemplating imposing? Again, the administration has no answer. And as we can see from the case of small pickups, things that are initially thought to, or intended to be kind of a temporary thing uh, can be very, very long-lived. And that seems like an incredible response, but as far as I can tell, that is the administration's thinking on these issues. Other questions? Right here at the front. Yeah, Uli Dadush with uh, OCP Policy Center in Google. Uh, for Marcus again. Um, so the uh, United States is essentially flouting the WTO in uh, uh, any number of areas. Section 301 is probably WTO inconsistent. The national security uh, appeal is uh, uh, basically blows a hole in the WTO. The uh, uh, voluntary export restriction on steel is not uh, WTO consistent. The United States is also not wanting to replace the appellate body. Question, Marcus, is uh, do you think we are heading towards a situation where the United States is effectively going to drop out of the WTO? And what are the consequences of that? Well, you know, obviously, I, I hope that we don't pull out of the WTO, though I, I agree that our actions, or at least the trajectory that we are on, will significantly degrade the WTO. I would also remind you that both while campaigning and since in office, the president has threatened to pull the United States out. That extreme scenario I showed that Sherman and Karen did, where the United States puts up a 30% tariff and everybody puts up a 30% tariff against the United States, but not against each other, was actually motivated sort of by that scenario, where in, in essence, the United States withdraws from the world, but the rest of the world doesn't withdraw from each other. So what happens? The worst affected country is the United States, second worst affected Canada, then Mexico, then some countries in Asia and Latin America and Europe and countries that don't trade too much or trade primarily with Europe like Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, South Asia are relatively insulated. Everyone loses, but the loss, the degree of loss or the degree of pain is felt unequally. Um, but I, that's not, one hopes that, um, that despite the apparent instincts of this administration, that there are enough constraints in the Congress, uh, specifically within the Republican caucuses, to kind of restrain this administration that seems to have um, a remarkably negative attitude towards international engagement in all forms. Fred Bergson here from the Institute. Mark, I think you were a little unfair to the Trump administration. Well, I'm a pimp for globalization. I'm the Darth Vader of globalism. Just ask Peter Navarro. You and I, both. Um, by which I mean, they have stated, the president personally has stated, one clear goal in his negotiations with the Chinese. He wants to reduce the U.S. bilateral trade deficit with China by $100 billion a year. So that is a metric against which you could judge any results. Forget all this stuff about level playing fields and all that. What he wants is some declaration of victory that he's cutting the bilateral deficit. Well, that's easy for the Chinese. They can announce purchases of so many more Boeings, of so many more soybeans, pursuing your objective of helping his political constituents. They can restrain exports of a variety of products. They can tell their firms to stop shipping products from China, move them over the border, and sell them from their subsidiaries in Vietnam, and that reduces the bilateral surplus with the United States. So you can add all that up, and you can get a lot of money. You can tell the administration that. Trump can declare victory. And there's no need for this nonsense about retaliation and trade wars, and the stock market will go up 2,000 points. Why isn't that a reasonable scenario? 
So, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's not an unreasonable question. If you had asked me a week or two ago, I would have thought that was the most likely outcome, that you would have a series of managed trade deals to twist Chinese purchases towards American providers, um, and, and that would be kind of the way it was turned off. What is interesting is in talking to uh, administration officials, they're not, that's not how they're talking. And the other problem is, and I don't, I don't totally understand why, but one of the problems is if you were tweeting that we have a $500 billion problem, then even your actions that could get you, what, $50 billion, $100 billion, that isn't going to look like you did too well. So they seem to be going off on a trajectory where they're going to act tough. They're not going to have clear goals. They're not going to have clear mechanisms for resolving the issues. And we, they really seem to be heading in a direction where the imposition of measures that were supposed to address some kind of issue uh, end up just being a permanent feature of US trade policy. Additional questions? Uh, Ted Truman here at the Institute. So, Karen, I'm going to ask you a, probably an unfair question. Uh, but after all, I represent, this is the Inter Institute for International Economics. So you had a chart there that showed the current account, which you commented was, has been remarkably docile. Uh, of course, you should have shown the trade, the merchandise trade balance these days. You're, right, the current account is not the relevant metric. But... Uh, uh, that's what they say. Uh, so, uh, but you didn't really say what you expect, you, you said uh, the expect are there, and there, what is the chances, this sort of feeds into Fred's uh, question, of that uh, trade balance, current account balance deteriorating quite rapidly, uh, notwithstanding the weakness of the, of the dollar, after all, we had in the 1980s, uh, uh, the dollar was weakening from 1985 on, right? And the tr trade balance uh, 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 deficit peaked in uh, 1987. Uh, and it was a fairly, na nasty, a fairly nasty period, uh, including, uh, including um, measures to, that forced the United States to change its fiscal policy slightly. So I wonder what to, uh, you may not remember that, you're too young. Uh, uh, so I wonder what you, you know, do you have any scenarios that would suggest that we're gonna have a big uh, weakness of the trade balance uh, that would, could also trigger uh, violent reactions? Uh, uh, though my guess is, and that's sort of, sort of well, the weird aspect of this, the more you rattle the trade, the tariff type, uh, uh, measures, the weaker the dollar be becomes. That was true, in the, again, in the 1980s. Uh, it's counterintuitive for us economists, but that uh, it's, uh, it's what the data says. I wonder whether you thought a bit about that. Yeah, um, thank you. I'm, I'm not sure that's entirely an unfair question. Um, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't show my forecast, um, and partly that was because uh, to have a lot of confidence in my forecast, I would have had to have conditioned it on assumptions about the dollar. And uh, kind of forecasting the dollar makes me uh, kind of, I find that very daunting, makes me very nervous, uh, particularly since we are having trouble explaining really what's going on now. Um, I expect a deterioration. I think a bigger deterioration is a risk um, to channel um, kind of Adam Posen, I think one of the big risks that comes from the larger just deterioration is uh, kind of the political risk. That this is going to, that could be a factor that then leads to, um, uh, at a minimum, more angry, kind of strong talk about this, but, you know, also possibly, you know, skirmishes turning into uh, wars uh, that has its own direct effects on the economy, as well as um, you know possibly effects through uh, destabilizing markets. So yeah, I think that there is. Um, you know, it's why I, I actually chose a title that actually included the word risk in there is because I do think that there I there are some um, 
there is a pretty serious underlying risk there. So thanks for asking about that. We have a question up, up here at the center table. Yeah, David Orden for Virginia Tech. I guess I wanted, uh, in some sense, the last question following Fred's got at some of the issue I wanted to get at. But um, aside from extremely managed trade, I mean, if these trade policies are not going to have a substantial effect on the trade deficit, uh, where, what kind of conflict does that lead to? Um, in, and how do we get out of that bind? Is half my question, the other half a little bit disconnected, is TPP seemed to be in quite a bit of political trouble even before the election. So, you know, we've gone from a situation that didn't look too promising to a situation that looks dramatically worse. How do we get back to something that looks uh, more positive? <laughs> okay, so <coughs> if we impose tariffs on 50 you know billion dollars of chinese trade or they impose 50 billion dollars of tariffs on our trade and it stops there it doesn't broaden either in terms of the us uh, china bilateral uh, relationship or it isn't generalized to other countries beyond china um, then we're sort of in the termites in the foundation scenario where you've disrupted trade, you've disrupted supply chains, they will eventually readjust, there will be some loss of efficiency, there'll be some downward pressure on productivity in the long run, and, and that's kind of it. And it's sort of a sad story, and 55 years from now, someone will be giving a talk at the Peterson Institute, and they'll say, why is it that we have a 25% tariff on, on, on uh, uh, cell phone screens? Oh, because there was this fight 55 years ago, and that's how we decided to resolve things, and they never got resolved, and it became a permanent feature, like, like, the, like the tariff on small pickups. Um, the problem is, is if you have a situation where the trade deficit is actually widening, and the administration attempts to address the trade deficit with trade policy. Um, and so, in fact, it does expand and it does widen to other participants beyond China, as it has in the cases of steel and aluminum, uh, solar cells, uh, washing machines, and so on. What's, what's not uh, uh, interesting fun fact to know and tell, the worst affected country so far has actually been South Korea, our political and military ally, because a lot of the Chinese imports are already under restriction, and so when you go after things like solar cells, or you go after washing machines, or you go after steel and aluminum, you're actually hitting the trade of people who are not already under restriction, and um, South Korea just happens to be unlucky. Um, so then you could actually end up in a more of a trade war type scenario where we're imposing broader restrictions and they're, and they're counter-retaliating, and, and at this point, it's all speculative because one doesn't have enough detail to, to, to really know how to model it. Uh, in terms of how do we get out of this mess, um, one of the things that gives me hope is that if one looks at public opinion polling data, so let me step back. So, so if you look at the Republican and Democratic primaries, presidential primaries, 2016, you had people running against trade and against trade agreements. You had Donald Trump on the Republican side, Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side. If you look at the public opinion polling data, the Sanders supporters were actually pretty pro-trade because they tended to be young, and the young people, if you look at this data, tend to be much more cosmopolitan and open to the world. They liked Bernie Sanders because of authenticity and the promise of free college educations. Uh, they were not voting for Bernie Sanders because he promised to renegotiate NAFTA or pull us out of TPP. So one hopes that it would be possible to reconstruct a pro-trade um, uh, uh, a coalition working with uh, a kind of younger demographic within the Democratic Party, which may be more open to trade, and uh, working with a Republican Party, which, uh, sad to say, re re appears to be remarkably malleable on uh, issues such as attitudes towards trade and uh, Russia that one would expect would be a little bit more deeply rooted. Uh, if you had different leadership in the Republican Party, you might be able to bring the Republican Party back to more of a historical uh, 
uh, position, and you could start to rebuild that pro-trade coalition. So I don't think that we're necessarily doomed to this forever. Indeed, I think this may simply be a passing kind of spasm. Uh, and the issue now is to keep that spasm relatively contained and uh, to keep the self-destruction at a relatively <laughs> low level. Can I just add, I just want to add just one thought, and Mark probably agrees with us. I think, um, yeah, you could get back there, but I think the talking points are going to be, need to be a little bit different. I don't think you can go back to the, to the rhetoric that, you know, uh, we should all be pro-trade because we all believe in globalism and globalism is so great for everyone. It needs to be, it needs to, you know, the, the new talking points need to recognize the, dis the hardships associated with workers being displaced and how uh, packages like TPP would in fact benefit uh, U.S. workers. We have time for one last question, if, if anybody has one. Fred, uh, or actually, could we could we do back back there? Could you use the stand up mic back there? Hi, uh, Brian Pangal with China Xinhua Liu Si I have a question for Max. Uh, actually, there are three parts of uh, the Trump administration's three zero one action towards China. You, you have mentioned the tariff proposal, but also the treasury is considering uh, imposed restrictions on Chinese investments in the United States. I'm wondering, could you elaborate what would that look like and would it uh, a similar region uh, to the CFUs or uh, as it else? Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, it, it gives me an opportunity to express at least some kind of um, well, I don't know, did not be so unfair as Fred put it towards the uh, uh, Trump administration. So uh, I, think if, I think if I were representing the Trump administration, I would say that, that, that they have a three-pronged policy. Uh, prong one is the tariffs that we've talked about today. Prong two is the investment issue that you have raised. And prong three is the case that they have brought to the WTO. So it's strange. At the same time, they're doing things that seem to degrade the WTO. They seem to be proud of the fact they're taking a case against China to the WTO. So they would say they have a three-pronged strategy, and they would say that uh, restrictions on Chinese uh, investment in the United States are necessary because of um, the, the ability of Chinese firms under, you know, for all sorts of reasons, they're state-owned or whatever, to buy up, you know, U.S. assets, and there must be greater restrictions put on that, and there must be some national security considerations as well. well I, should, I should say that I'm not unsympathetic to those, those, those concerns. I think that China has a very different system. I think it does create asymmetries in our interactions with China. I would like to see whatever you, you want to call it, a more common set of rules, a more level playing field. I, 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 am, you know, I am concerned about somebody whose email <laughs> account gets hacked on a regular basis. I'm uh, concerned about you know, cyber issues. It's not like I think that, that, that China is some sort of a lamb out there and the United States is just teeing off on it. I think there are real issues in Chinese economic behavior and the United States economic relationship with China. The thing is, I just am extremely skeptical that this package implemented by this group is going to resolve those issues. And you know, I, all I know is when you ask what are the specifics on the, there may be people who understand the specifics on the investment policy better than I do. All I know is it seems to be aimed to reducing it because of concerns about un, un, unlevel playing fields uh, created by state support as well as national security concerns. Well, on behalf of our President Adam Posen, I would like to thank everybody for your attendance and participation in today's meeting, and I hope you can also, along with me, express your appreciation to our three presenters today. <laughs>